how the heck did you write three complete novels, like 1,200 pages, before you even had a publishing deal? All that 800 kilometers, my body was in so much pain, my emotions were f crippled. I thought I was going to go back to my normal life, but it completely changed my life. I wanted to snowboard over in France in the French Alps, so I made out I was a chef and I become like a f head chef over in Italy because of it. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Tell me more. How did that happen? We got a lot of people really wealthy quickly, myself included. I made a lot of mistakes. I wasn't ready for that. But, you know, I didn't want to write for Disney musicals at all. And a lot of the people that I came up with who were so talented had a hard time transitioning into monetizing the art form. So I dropped out, didn't have much of a plan, and I found this garage on Craigslist. It was only 500 bucks a month, and I shared it with the car of the landlord. It was terrible. I'd be worried for you. People told me I was crazy, and then Hans Zimmer contacted me. If you got to make it, you got to make it, right? If you really want something desperate, you'll make it happen. You've heard the line, do what you love and the money will follow. And that is all well and good if you are spending all day every day doing what you love and the money is flowing in. But if if the money isn't flowing in <laughs> or you feel trapped in a career and a job in a, in a company that you hate, it is a huge leap of faith to just suddenly like follow this Instagram wisdom, this one liner and go do what you love and the money will follow. And yet for some people, they have figured this out. Today, we are highlighting eight people from the Mark Drager Show podcast who have done exactly that. They have followed their passions. They have gone out on their own. They are doing what they love and the money is following. And these are eight badass people, but they're not unlike you and they're not unlike me which is what is so remarkable about them. This is not some kind of weight loss program where at the bottom in the ad it's gonna say like results might vary because it's not really achievable. This is achievable for you. If you haven't figured out how to do what you love, if the money isn't flowing, stay tuned because I got eight clips that will completely blow your mind. Lesson one, how to go from a side hustle to a full-time gig taught by my good friend Oz Perlman who went from being a, a magician at kids parties to literally almost winning America's Got Talent. Folks divorced and this kind of filled a void for me. I think a lot of people have some sort of trauma in their life. It was not a good divorce. And so magic was my escape. I did magic to not deal with kind of the ramifications of my family exploding. And this was what I did as kind of like, this is what I put all my passion and effort into was card tricks, magic. And I started working when I was 14. So at age 14, I was already learning sales, how to make money, how to promote myself. Because by the age of 16, I finished high school. I went to college. Nobody paid for my college. I, like My parents couldn't afford to pay for college. So I did this to pay for schooling. And I had a couple side businesses, but this is how tuition and rent and food got on my plate. <laughs> and so in those early days, you may have been really young. It was a passion. It was a side hustle. At what point did you take it seriously enough to be able to say, you know what? This is... Uh, it may have been when you were working at... I think you were working at Merrill Lynch. But yep. at what point did you go, you know what? This is actually a thing that could be my thing. You know, you have kind of epiphany moments, which sometimes you see them in the moment, where sometimes you only see them in hindsight. Do you know that kind of feeling where later on you realize, wow, somebody just flipped a switch? And there was a magician, I remember this conversation vividly, where I didn't think you could do this for a career. Even though I was working restaurants three of the nights of the week, I was doing all these parties on the side. And I had this conversation with a magician who's a professional. And he's like, when are you gonna quit your job? And I was like, what are you crazy? I'm not quitting my job, but you know, I've got a great paycheck. I actually had a very good job. If you look backwards, I had an amazing career opportunity. I was making way too much money as a 21 year old. And I just said, why would I quit my job? And he goes, well, do you love it? And I go, well, no. And he goes, do you love doing magic? And I said, yes. These were all simple questions. And then he goes, well, what do you need? And I just threw out a number. At the time, I'm like, I got to make six figures. And he goes, well, what do you make per show now? And he just literally in the span of 90 seconds took all this jumbled thing in my brain that just aligned my focus, which has said, well, what do you, you need X amount of shows. How many shows do you know? What's the increase? And he just broke it down. He goes, well, can you double your amount of shows in the next year? And I go, well, yeah. And he goes, then what's the problem? And it's one of those moments where, what is the problem? And he just like, so many of us have these desires. We want to do these things that we dream for, but we never break it down into attainable small goals that you realize I can make it from point A to B to C to D and eventually I'll be at my dream. So it was that 
it was luck and timing, which is I had no kids. I wasn't married. Do you know what? If I quit my job, what's the worst that happens, Mark? I'll find another job. That's how I back, You'll go back to IT afterwards, right? It's true. But if this would have happened four years later in 2009, when there was the Great Recession, I probably wouldn't have the balls. I would have said, I don't know if I could find another job. So you got to find timing and you got to have that little bit of luck in life. But I also feel you can't swim if you're always on the, like, you got to jump in the deep end eventually. And I need to cut the cord and not have a paycheck coming in to be hungry enough to wake up on the couch one morning and be like, what do I do? There's no playbook for being a professional mentalist. I don't know how to do it. Figure it out. Number two, how to break through your fear by just jumping into life by the Aussie Damien Ryder. Jump and break the fear and then wait six months, wait nine months, wait a year. That's not the answer. The answer is to always be jumping because you don't allow for that fear to creep back in. Now you're saying the answer is to break the fear down completely, which sounds to me like you're unlocking a brand new level of thinking for me because I've always just thought, just keep throwing yourself at things. But you're saying that you can actually break the fear. How? Well, for me, I just look at it in a more logical sense. So, <laughs> As opposed to my illogical sense. <laughs> yeah, well, most people do. You know, so let's go back to the you know the climb of the tree, the jump jumping off into the water. The logical sense would be, oh, I was all right last time, so I'm going to be all right this time, and that's it. And you run and jump. Now, that's not to say that the inner critic's not going to be in your head, but it's just if you think of that inner critic more like background music, you can have background music going on and not be engaged in it and do your work and, you know, be focused on work that you got going on, then all of a sudden, like, a song comes on that you like and then you can, like, boom, be engaged in it. Then I I don't like next one, got to go back to work. And then that's out again. And same thing that can happen with your inner critic as well. You know, we can either engage in it or we don't engage in it. But it's also, if you think of, like, you know, monkey mind, it's called, so think a monkey running around the tree and everything, if you sit, sit there, the monkey's going to keep on going. But if you just if you go against it or give it a little job task, then it kind of just chills out and just goes away and then, then off you go. You're jumping off into the water again. So for me, it's just about breaking them down and looking at it in a more logical sense and not having the doubt of other people. And it takes a little bit of time, but for me, I just started to have a look at people who were doubting me Saying, "Oh no, nah, you 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 can't you, you can't run around Phuket Island. You, it's impossible. You can't run that 130 kilometers around Phuket Island." Let's say. Now, for me, I started to have a look at them and go, "You don't even walk around the block. How do you know <laughs> if someone can run around an island? Like, who are you to say that? What have you done?" So I went and had this interview, and the executive chef, he was like, "Oh, you look like a young George Clooney." And I was like, oh, cool. Does that mean I've got a job? And he's like, yeah, all right. Okay, you can start. So I became like a shallow host and I was supposed to start just cooking like continental breakfast for people staying in the chalet and, and then cook them like a set dinner at night. And then the, the day before I was supposed to start, we got poached by this other ski company. So I went over there and I'm like, what, what am I now? So the executive chef's like, oh, you can be sous chef. So you're second in charge. So I was like, now, where there was like seven chefs underneath me, this huge kitchen, flagship hotel, and I was thinking, what the f- is going on here? But have you ever worked in a commercial kitchen? Never worked in a commercial kitchen right before. I was like, oh yeah, sign me up on this because they give me an apartment, the lift passes, all the old thing, and I can fucking blag my way through here, no worries. But some of the things like the chefs would go, oh, chef, chef, come over here, taste this. And I'd have a taste and think, what the f- am I even tasting here? And I'd go, oh, what do you think it needs, mate? And I go, oh, seasoning, that's it, spot on, son, get onto it. <laughs> I just wander on, right? <laughs> I just hang out with the baker most of the time because he was an Aussie as well. I just get him to make me little fucking donuts and shit that he wasn't supposed to make. And then anyway, they're like, all right, you've got to go over to Italy and run this hotel over there, like as a head chef. And I was like, that's like a sous chef. There's other people who can like carry my weight. This is a head chef. You got to come up with the menu. You got to you got to find suppliers. Menu, you have to buy I was ingredients. Freaking out, right? Going, oh, sh- what's going on here? I was thinking, I was like 28 at the time, right? So I was like, sh-. so I went over to Italy and I was just going, what's going on here? And anyway, the manager she goes, oh, Damien, come here. The last chef he he ordered all these cod, and she's like, I'm thinking, oh, f- how much cod can he order? Like the fish cod. I'm thinking, no one eats that. 
And um, there's also like three freezers. So he's done some dodgy deal, right? This last previous head chef. And I was like, so I'm sitting there and I remember like when I was younger, I got sponsored by like these board shorts called Xander, Xander board shorts, right? When I was surfing. So I was thinking, all right, so I'm going to- Hold on, you were a good this- enough surfer to be sponsored? Uh, don't, like here's a pair of board shorts. I wouldn't call okay. it a sponsor or anything, right? <laughs> so I'm like, all right, well, I'm going to put, I'm going to put this out as a- Ocean Xander fillet on a white wine creamy dill reduction on a better mash, right? I'm thinking that sounds cool. So I put it on. There's no such fish called Xander, right? At all. There's no, no fish that I know of. <laughs> so I lay it out and I, we're putting it out. And I told the other couple of little chefs what we're doing. Our like, manager comes in. She's like, Damien, Damien, the uh, people want to see you in the restaurant. I'm thinking, I'm gone. That's it. Pack my shit. I'm out of here, right? Walk out. Everyone's standing ovation. You go, woo! And I'm like, what's going on here? They're like, this is the best Xander fillet I've ever had. <laughs> I was like, what the hell? Good to be like, this is crazy. And then, then it like, got weird, right? So I went snowboarding this one day and then I'll come back and- Hold on, hold on, hold day. on. Got weird after that? It wasn't weird yeah, before yeah. that? Nah. She got even more weird, right? And um, so I'm, I'm snowboarding all day. And um, the previous head chef, he was Aussie as well. He'd done this dodgy fucking deal, right? He must have been this dodgy dude. And it's only a small town, right? Savinia. So I'll go back and I'm at my hotel and then I'll get woken up by the manager. And she's like, Damien, Damien, what have you done? And I said, oh, nothing. What do you mean? And I was saying, fuck, is the kitchen on fire? No. And she goes, no, no, no. The police are coming for you. And I was like, what the are they coming for me for? I'm like, she goes, oh, the person at this other uh, hotel, he's called him and you've had dealings. I said, no, I've only just got here. That must be the the previous guy, not me. Let me go and sort it out. And she goes, nah, it's not like that here. There's a guy here waiting for you. And I was like, who's this guy? Anyway, I walk out, there's this guy, he's about seven foot tall, no neck, bald head, huge dude. And he goes, you're coming with me. I'm like, what? F- I'm going with you, mate. Look at the size here. And he goes, nah. She goes, no, here's my friend. Uh, my friends in the mafia, they've given the police, they said, give him two hours to get out of the country. So they've got to run you back across the border, back into France. I was like, what? And I had to like, my girlfriend was with me at the time and she's just bawling her eyes out going, I'm not going anywhere with this guy. They're going to kill us. And I was like, just get in the car. We'll be right. Back to where she got in this car and drove off. And then went across the border and back into France. The guy didn't say a word the whole way. I tried to talk to him. He didn't say nothing. And then, Dropped us off at the the train station and that was it back in London after that. Number three, how to go from being broke to monetizing your art form with the award-winning rapper and poet in Q. There's always compromises that you have to make in life. And if you are not willing to compromise, you can't be in relationship with the world. You can go live on a mountaintop. You can go live in the forest. But if you want to be in the world, you have to compromise. There's a difference, though, between compromise and sacrifice. And only you will know what is a sacrifice. This is in like primary relationships. It's in business. It's in every area of your life. Friendships. You know, there are things that are non-negotiable for me in primary relationships. I'll give you an example. Trust non-negotiable for me, bro. Like I, I don't, I am one of these people, how I was raised because of the things that I went through. Trust is the number one thing for other people. Trust is not even that big of a deal. You know, some relationships, they go outside of the relationship. They play, there, there's all sorts of things that people are okay with that I'm not okay with. And there are all sorts of things that like vice versa, right? So you just have to know for yourself, what is the difference between a compromise and a sacrifice? When I first got into songwriting, I felt like this was a compromise for me. And I thought at that time, a compromise might be a sacrifice. I didn't really know how to separate them. I wasn't like listening to pop music at the time. I had always wanted to be a rapper. I wasn't trying to like write pop songs. I've written over 50 songs for Disney television. Uh, we got nominated for an Emmy 
in the end of last year for one of the songs that I wrote. I didn't want to write for Disney musicals on television. <laughs> so, so you're saying that 19 year old who wanted to be a signed rapper wasn't like one day I'm he would have Disney. punched me in the face, <laughs> bro. <laughs> he would have called you out, would he? Yes, he would have thought, "Oh, you're such a sellout." But the thing is, like that doing that, you have to understand, was one of the biggest and best creative decisions of my life. Not only financially, I had to use different tools to create. And by using different tools, I developed different skills. And by developing different skills, when I went back to writing for myself, I had different ways to express. Different tools to, you know, share my art with the world. And uh, so it turned out to be one of the best things that ever happened. And then that financial security that I got ended up being the foundation that allowed me to get back into poetry very consciously. I think a lot of people, because poetry doesn't have a specific monetization, a specific machine behind it as a creative genre, they wind up using their skills in poetry to get into another area that they can monetize and then they stay there. And I was able to do that into this other area. And then I was able to simultaneously start to build back into poetry because it was something that I was really passionate about. Number four, how this author went from a disastrous pitch and he could not for the life of him get a book deal to being able to sell over 1 million copies of his fantasy books. The one, the only Brent Weeks. When people come to me and they're like, hey, I wanna be a writer. I say, okay. Well, understand you're talking to a guy who's making a living doing this and most people don't, you know, and I sell best selling books and most people don't. So if you don't love writing, if you don't love the act of it, like there are better ways to make a living and easier ways. And writing is incredibly difficult. You do not know what the payoff is going to be. So if you don't love it, don't do it. Find something else. Like if you're perfectly happy, you know, you know some like, oh, I've got, I can play music on the side or, or I, I, can, I can write little stories for my, for a play in the community theater once a year. And otherwise I'm really happy having sane coworkers and a good boss and, and having a 401k. It's like, man, if, if those things can make you happy and you can scratch that itch, you know, one hour a week and do that because this life, it's the perfect in incubator for paranoia, like all the things that control your life are thousands of miles away. You can make a book like mine. And that I really thought like I had this thing in my head. I was like, I would read books and I'd be like, I'm better than that. My book is better than that. But then I always had in my head, what if I'm wrong? You know, there's those guys who go on American Idol who's like, I'm the best singer ever. And you're yeah. like, and they sing and you're like, dude. How have you made it to 28 thinking you can sing? Because you're awful. And so I always had that in my head of, of like, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm that guy. Like, I don't think I'm that guy, but but maybe I am. Man, if you're an agency, like, don't do this to people. They took a rubber stamper. They stamped my own letter. They put it in the envelope and they sent it back to me. Like, they didn't even give me a piece of paper saying it was rejection. It was a stamp. Thank you. No. So, you, you, you know, some other gibberish on there. Uh, uh, another place would send like a little fraction of paper, like this big. Like, you're not worth a full nine, you know, eight and a half by 11 piece of paper. We're going to send you just this snippet because we don't want to waste paper on you, buddy. You're not worth. So, so you said, okay, this is the part where everyone's going to stop listening. Everyone's going to click. Everyone's going to bail on YouTube. Yeah. yeah. And yet, I don't think so. I don't think so because what you're explaining is the truth that yeah. if you want to be successful like you, if you want to be in the NBA, if you want to be in the NFL, if you want to be Steve Jobs, if you want to launch that business, if you want to be the actor, if you want to be in Hollywood, no matter what it is, one, it's an extremely competitive sport at the top. Yeah. The only people who can get there are the people who are willing to put in the years of work and grind and effort. Mm -hmm. And so it's not like, hey, only do this if you're guaranteed a spot at the top. It's right. if you want a shot at your dream coming true, right. you have to be willing to do it. Yeah. I think that's optimistic. I think that's hopeful, isn't it? I mean, yeah, like, I, it's good to me to know, like, hey, if I'm willing to put in the work and I love it and it's, and I'm going to develop my craft and I'm going to commit to this and I'm just going to keep going year after year after year. I mean, you might have been 70 by the time your first book got published, but if you never gave up along the way, I have to imagine those 50 years of working in, you know, in solitude would eventually pay off. No. Right. 
Yeah, I absolutely think so. And I mean, but it's like, there's, there's, you know, there's ways to succeed and there's ways to keep writing. And so for me to ask the full sacrifice from my wife, like I, and, and from myself, you know, it's like, okay, our life is kind of on hold. We don't want to have kids when we have no income. Right. It's like, I needed to have something to believe in. And that something just wasn't me. It, it was like, I think I write well enough that I can be a published writer. I think I could do very well actually at writing. I think that's true. I'm pretty sure that's true. Like I'm sending it to people and they're rejecting me. So they don't believe it, but I think it's true, but there is great work that gets overlooked all the time. There are great writers who are only recognized as great after they're dead, you know? So like that thing where there's no guaranteed happy ending was just in my mind. And that wasn't all, you know, self doubt. That was just like, man, the world is rough, you know? (laughs) And there's some great people who deserve to make it. And don't, you know, I went to high school with a guy who's a fantastic athlete and he should have been playing college ball and he just gets an injury, you know, and it's like he gets an ankle injury and he doesn't go to the doctor because he's poor and he doesn't heal right. And it's just like he doesn't play college ball. The dude should have been in the NFL for a year or two. You know, he, he wouldn't have been a great, great of all time. But it's like, dang, like life is like that. So I just had this thing like where it came down to is like, why am I not quitting when this seems ridiculous? Is like, I think this is what I'm made to do. I think this is what God has told me to keep doing. Only one person ever asked me, you know, what's your plan B? And I said, I have no plan B. Number five, how the celloist Tina Gao sidestepped the traditional career of playing in a symphony, which her parents really wanted her to do. And instead found herself touring with Cirque du Soleil and working alongside Hans Zimmer on all of Hollywood's biggest blockbuster films. I was really just trying to do whatever I could to to make a buck, you know? And so at that time, uh, I was living in Canoga Park in the studio apartment, which I felt was pretty fancy because I actually had a kitchen. And then I got a call uh, from on my cell phone and I looked at it and it was from Montreal. And I'm like, I'm not answering that. Cause at the time, like if it was an international number, you'd have to pay for it. It was like 20 cents a minute. I'm like, Oh my God, am I going to put 20 <laughs> cents? Like that's not good. So I did an answer and they left a voicemail and it was Cirque du Soleil. I mean, it was a circus, like it's completely random. And so they had seen my music video on YouTube, the same video. That music video has, yes, has opened that, a lot it of really doors paid for off. you. It did, it did. <laughs> and then after that, there are some other like classical videos. I started doing some other ones, um, but it wasn't, I still didn't have a lot of content. It was just that there's some like concert footage. Uh, there's a classical video that I did. And so they asked me, they're like, we saw your, so I never auditioned. They said, we saw your videos on YouTube and there's three shows uh, that we're in pre-production for. We'd like to offer you a position. I'm like, really? Like, you know, what are these shows? And so there was the Michael Jackson, the Immortal World Tour, which is the one I ended up on. It's an arena tour playing the electric cello, playing like, I mean, it's like Michael Jackson's music, but kind of like rock, pop, rock music. Um, but it would be the electric cello. Obviously, he didn't have electric cello. It would be playing like the guitar parts. And I thought, oh my God, like people told me I was crazy. You can't play electric cello and like shred in an arena. Like, are you insane? Like, that's just not going to happen. And that's, you know, so there was that one. And the two other shows, yeah. Amaluna, which yeah. is like an all-female show, whatever, like the other stuff, you know? So, so because because as you're telling the story, you know, buying the $65,000 cello and $100,000 mm-hmm. in debt and scraping mm-hmm. to get by and two or three years of going in on other stuff, in my head, I'm thinking, if you were my sister, if you were my daughter, if you were my mm-hmm. friend, mm-hmm. I think... I think I would be in the your delusional camp, and yeah, and, no, I, and I and I'm the guy yeah. I'm the guy who wants to rally creatives and entrepreneurs to take the risks you're taking. But I yeah. think I would really struggle to be like, I, I'd be worried for you. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I, I would. No, I would too. And I think that the thing is, you have to look at somebody's actions and their thought process. So if I was in this whole situation and I wasn't you know, waking up every day, five, six in the morning, like practicing every day, being very analytical about it, like trying everything. And also at the time you're in your early twenties. So I'm like, uh, like I can probably still audition and whatnot, but yeah, I mean, I mean, I definitely, like I mentioned earlier, like almost gave up because I'm like, this is ridiculous. Maybe I am crazy. Um, but I was not, I definitely was not expecting, um, that call from Cirque. And I remember I had just finished filming the first episode of America's Got Talent. So that was another thing that they like contacted me. So I, uh, I filmed it. And then I'm like, okay, do I take a contract with the circus or do I do America's Got Talent? And of course I'm going to take the contract because they offered, they were offering 3,500 a week. And I'm like, 3,500 a week. Yeah. I mean, that was like, wow. that was a lot, right? <laughs> Plus like really good, you know, Cigna health insurance. And it was a three-year contract. So quickly I calculated, like if I, obviously there's taxes, but you know, if I save like everything, I could pay off all my debt. I can actually like 
start saving. I've always wanted to start investing, but I didn't have any money to invest, you know? So I took the contract uh, and then I went to Montreal and then I was on that tour for two years. And at the time that I was on tour, <clears throat> I thought, oh my God, you know, and the, the universe has given me like some kind of like gift and, and to reward me. So I better not waste this opportunity. I have to be really careful. Um, cause I remember like a lot of, you know, people get excited when they first start making money and they spend it immediately, you know, lifestyle inflation. Um, and for me, I was lucky because when you're on tour, they pay for all your living expenses because you're living out of hotels. So I immediately got rid of everything. The only thing I kept was my car, which was paid off. It was like a, a salvage title that I got at some really shady dealership. So that was, you know, that was a <laughs> that was parked at my parents' house. Um, I actually got rid of my cell phone plan because I'm like, I'm not going to pay like 50 bucks a month for a phone. That's like a waste of money. Not good because like I, I probably needed the phone you at some point. And you lost your you lost your contact number. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I had like the phone. So if you were signed into Wi-Fi, you could like use like, you know, okay. like WhatsApp or whatever. I mean, it was, yeah. And so I spent $20 a week. And I know that this is only possible because I was on a tour. So usually, you know, all your meals, like sometimes breakfast is included at the hotels. And then when you do a show, you know, there's catering and I would not steal, but I would take, you know, some food from, from craft services, which is what you're supposed to do. Yeah. Yeah. And then like it's it's there, it's just sitting there, there. you know, you might as well slip it into your purse or your (laughs) pillow bag. Yeah. And I like basically lived off of like power bars and stuff like that on the days that we weren't doing shows. Once in a while, I remember it's like really if like to, to treat myself, I would order room service, but I was only, I would only get the soup because it was usually like cheap. It was like a, you know, appetizer, 10, $15, maybe if it's at like a nicer hotel and then ask for extra bread. I was just like, eat. I mean, this is so sad, but I would just eat like all this bread. And like, I was just really trying, like, I'm like, I'm not going to spend over $20 a week. I'm not, I'm going to pay off all my debt, all of it. Number six. I didn't say these were all gonna be good things, but you can make money doing what you love. (laughs) Damon West talks about how he fed his drug addiction by breaking and entering and a life of crime. A quantity of dope, let's say it's meth. They'll take, let's say it, an ounce of meth and they'll break it up into different little segments to sell. And they know exactly which baggie they break even when they break it up. Then they know the next baggie that they're gonna make enough profit to buy a second batch. Then they know the next baggie they're gonna make to buy a third batch and a fourth batch and a fifth batch. Dope dealers are, for all of its purposes, they're like entrepreneurs, but in a bad way. I mean, they're out there and they understand the business model of I have a stock of a supply, I've gotta sell this supply and I've gotta go out and then I gotta buy more because the demand becomes higher and higher, right? But these dope dealers, they're connected into all these different parts of the underworld in organized crime throughout every city in America. And so when a dope dealer tells me, hey, Damon, if you come across a sub-zero fridge, bring that to me. That's a $15,000 refrigerator, by the way, man. Yeah, so, yeah, no, I know. I've been looking into one. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, so, and I found them. I mean, I'd find them all the time. I'd find, you know, but it, if you find one of those, bring it to me, I'll give you some dope for it because that dope dealer has other people he or she is selling it too. I don't know uh, who the people are, but they're moving. They've started an appliance store on the side. You see what I'm saying? They're an entrepreneur that started out in the dope world, and now they're basically running a pawn shop on the side. They've got uh, all this other they can, stuff. And going. then they can do. They can they take the stuff. Yeah, some, and all low the cost, for it. and then clean clean the clean the money. Absolutely, man. But low cost in the sense that it, they paid for it with dope, which is already the profit margin because they'd already sold enough dope to buy the next batch. Now yeah. they're dealing with pure profit over here. That's their investment money. They're taking. So what that made in- you, as the leader of this micro ring, what made you so good at that? Um, I don't know. I don't know that good is the try. Well, I guess like here's the deal. Well, you were the leader. I mean, like I'm the leader. Like, and, you and had we, the connections. You had the network. Like there must have been some inherent skill set or something you brought to it that made you not just one of the other fifteen meth yeah, so you know, meth heads following everyone else. I mean, here's the deal. I, Everybody has this preservation of life instinct. No one wants to get caught. And even though I'm out in the dope world and I'm spun out of control, I don't want to get caught. I don't want to go down. And so, look, man, one of the first burglaries I did, I broke into a U.S. post office and I stole a mailman uniform, mailman bag, mailman hat, the whole thing. And that was the disguise that I used to scope out and check out neighborhoods, condo buildings, stuff like that. You can't tell me what your mailman looks like. No one knows what the mailman looks like. And so the mailman uniform gave me a good cover to go around checking out places, checking out the security in different places. Um, but some of the things, some of the different things that, you know, came up with that we could do to 
figure out where we're going to break into is some of these buildings in, in uptown Dallas, they had these mail kiosks inside these condos. And the mail kiosk looks like this. It's got four walls. One of the walls has a door. The other three walls has all the little boxes that you have your individual key to open that box. But that door, if you can get in the other side of that door, which I can pick locks inside that room, is all these different holes and boxes of all those yeah, mail all, it's, slots. It's the, back, it's the back end of all the slots, That's right? right? So and you open one door and you have access to all of them. All of them. And then you see mail stacked up in one of these boxes, right? That person's not home. They haven't checked their mail in a week or so. Or sometimes you see a note that says, out of town from this date to this date, hold our mail. And that oh. is how I'm picking out, some of the times, how I'm picking out how I'm going to break into places. And... um then, you know, we had a box truck. I had a box truck and I had a bunch of other dope fiends dressed up in dicky overalls. So a guy walking around with a clipboard. We look like a moving company. People would let us in. I mean, people would get the gate for us at these condo buildings when you're wiping out their neighbor's place. So I tried to apply everything I could, Mark, to not get caught. I would take some of the stolen because co- you get into these places, you find out people are out of town. One of the first things I'm going to look for when I go into these condo buildings or whatever is the, the key fob to the vehicle that's likely left behind. And if I can find that spare key fob, I just go in the parking garage and I hit the button until I heard the boop. And then I would take that luxury car, uh, fill it with things you don't want to keep from a burglary, checkbook, credit cards, uh, laptops, things that can be traced back to it, throw them in the back seat of that car, have my partner in crime, Dustin, follow me to some of the worst neighborhoods in Dallas. And I'd find a busy street corner. Maybe there's a car wash and people are hanging out at the car wash on, on a weekend. I'd pull up in that $100,000 car, that Mercedes, that Land Rover, that Beamer, pull up to that really, really busy street corner, window rolled down, music blaring, engine running, get out of the car, go across the street, get in Dustin's car and leave that car running right there. Now, I don't know how long those cars would last out there, maybe five minutes maybe 10 minutes before jump, someone jumps in the car and says, man, there's a car with a key in it. Oh, look in the back. There's credit cards. There's checkbook. Let's go buy some stuff. That is what we use as a diversion tactic in some of the cases. And But ultimately, in the end, it would be the cars that did us in because Dustin, of course, was caught with one of the stolen cars. But I want to stress this when we're talking about the burglary, because I've talked about all this stuff in the book that I wrote called The Change Agent. But I want to stress this, that my victims, when I broke into people's homes, I didn't just steal their property, brother. I stole something way more valuable from my victims. I stole their sense of security. And I do not think my victims will ever get that back. So there's no glory in the stuff that I'm telling you how we did it. Number seven, the entrepreneur who was living a crazy, over-the-top, Wolf of Wall Street-style life, Ryan Blair went from bankrupt almost to multi-millions to walking away from it all. When you hit rock bottom, that's when you really get to find out who you are. And that's when you really get to find out about your relationship with your higher power. And that's when you begin to climb again. And so while I still had assets and I still had money when I hit rock bottom, I had no friends. I had no support. I was in dire straits. I was angry. I was triggered. I was blowing up left and right. You know, I was just a mess. And from that mess, I started to develop a message. And from that mess, I started to, you know, uh, just discover who I really was and then start to take action for it. And it was not hard. You know, it was starting from scratch on me, on everything that I thought I knew. I had to throw it out the window and start over. How did you rebuild your confidence? That was tough. I wasn't competent enough to re- look at my SMSs during this period of time. I wasn't confident enough to email during this period of time. I was ashamed of who I was. I had guilt. I went through lots of, of reputational uh, uh, catastrophes. Like I was confidence level negative 100 in comparison to the artificial confidence that I thought I had where I, you know, I could command a stage and sit on TV and tell people, you know, blah, blah, blah. I went to negative 100. And what I learned was that my adversity that I had gone through, and it was a lot and more than most people will ever endeavor, you know, to go through in a lifetime. And certainly prior to being an entrepreneur, I had a lot of adversity. And then as an entrepreneur, I created a lot of adversity. And then now I'm at the peak of adversity. I realized that adversity was my authority. That adversity 
was the fuel for the character and the competency that I would build going forward. And it was one, you know, action at a time, one book at a time, one meditation at a time, one, uh, uh, activity at a time until I started building a confidence level to where I could start to build and scale a business again. And now I have, you know, a company that's, uh, growing and scaling, you know, to the same rate that, uh, Vice Alice did in its early days. So I have something that I built that, you know, I'm working with, you know, renowned scientists building artificial intelligence, uh, helping entrepreneurs, doing what I love and working with people that I love. But I share that story with you because I want anyone listening to know that you can start over at any time. I had to start over at 40 and I had to start over and I had to start over with a deficit. And now I'm, you know, I'll tell you, I have the love of my life. I'm, you know, I have a great team members. I'm doing inspiring work. I'm happy, I'm joyful, and I'm growing every single day. So you can do anything as long as you really turn to those values deep inside of you and you start to express yourself through them. And number eight, how Melissa Urban went from being addicted to drugs to figuring out her life and using that as the impetus for the company that she grew into multi-million dollar business. I had experienced trauma at the age of 16 that led me to use drugs. I spent five years as a drug addict. I finally went into recovery, relapsed after a year, went into recovery for the second time in the year 2000, my final time. And then I went through just a ton of therapy. I've been in therapy for the last 25 years, like off and on, but very regularly. And as part of my therapeutic practices, I learned how to reconnect. I had just cut off all connection with my body and my feelings because of my trauma and the drug use. And so I've built in moments throughout my day and practices throughout my day, whether I'm working out or meditating or hiking or just taking small moments to check in with myself. So it has become such a natural practice that I don't think I emphasized it as much as I should have that other people have not begun to or learned to or even been given permission to do this thing that I have reclaimed for myself. So yeah, I absolutely think that's why I didn't emphasize it as much as I wish I had. And how do you, after 25 years of therapy and and, I mean, anyone who's seeing you, anyone who's meeting you, I mean, I would never have guessed that, that your background of five years of drug addiction. And we're not talking just light stuff either. Like we're talking about fairly serious drug addiction and going to rehab and, and then a year later relapsing and what have you. But I, I would never have anticipated that. All we see is the brand new version of you, the person who's running an organization to help us embrace new habits and to get healthy and to focus on food and now to focus on boundaries and all of this stuff. And so how have you gotten really good at it? You mentioned 25 years of therapy, but how have you gotten better? What are the little things you do to be able to check in with yourself? Movement for me is a really big part of that practice. So in my recovery, like really early on in my recovery, the second time I recognized that I would have to change everything about my life. If I was going to really make this recovery stick, I needed to become the healthy person with healthy habits that I certainly didn't see myself as at the time. And so I thought to myself, what would a healthy person with healthy habits do? They would get up at 530 in the morning and go to the gym. So I started my practice of going to the gym five or six mornings a week in the morning in 2000. I've maintained it for the last 23 years. And I've come to realize that movement for me first thing in the morning is a way to physically move through my stress, my anxiety, anything that's been popping up, these kind of like hidden shadow work even. I need to physically move my body and get some of this stuff up and going before I can then drop into thinking about this a bit more theoretically or doing like some more detailed somatic work to move it through, process it in my body. So movement is a huge piece of it. I do a post-workout meditation after every single workout. So I move and process and then I sit down and I'm quiet and I reconnect with like God or the universe or past Melissa or future Melissa or parallel timeline Melissa, like whatever is on the buffet of connection. But those are two things that I do every single morning that starts my day off in this form of connection. And through that in then my boundary practice now, like I don't say yes to anything automatically. I don't (laughs) ever say yes, right? I'm always pausing, whether it's for a minute or a second, or I'll get back to you tomorrow, or I'll let you know next week. Like, I don't say yes until I'm like, what do I need? What do I want? Do I have capacity for this? Do I have energy for this? Would I enjoy this? 
Um, and so those are all just things that I think I've built into my regular everyday routine and all of my relationships that, that help. But it definitely started with a movement practice. That was the beginning, the entry point towards reconnecting with my body. Did you struggle with self-esteem? Because I've realized that a big challenge that we have, uh, doubters or haters or people with a fixed mindset, a challenge that I used to have was I realized at a certain point that it really came down to self-esteem. Like I had to believe that I was worth mm -hmm. it. That So it's nice to be able to, to talk about tactics. But at the end of the day, I wanted a lot of things but they were desires. Like, I want those things. And I know what people do to, in order to get them. And I'm not sure if I'm willing to do the work. And I know that I love the idea of what would a healthy person do? A healthy person would do this thing. So I'm going to be a healthy person. I'll go off and do it. But perhaps we feel like we don't deserve it or it will never happen or it's not worth it. Like those really deep fears yeah. and doubts that crop up. Did you struggle with self-esteem and all of that stuff? Yes. Every single morning I woke up to go to the gym, I would look in the mirror at all of these other people around me lifting weights and running and being fit. And I would think to myself, they don't know that I am a worthless loser drug addict. They don't know that I'm a terrible, awful person who lies and cheats and steals and manipulates like every single morning I would tell myself because that's still how I felt. But I kept going. I kept showing up anyway. And I will tell you, I probably owe my recovery solely to external validation for at least the first two or three years. I met a group of girls at the gym and we started running together. They didn't know that I was fresh out of rehab. I didn't talk about that aspect of my life with them for a really long time. They just knew that I was new to the gym, new to the city because I'd moved and I was interested in running. So I started running with them and they didn't know me as anything other than... Melissa, who shows up at the gym five mornings a week, I took a new job. And this new job didn't know me as anything other than this Melissa, who was the executive assistant, who like quickly got promoted because she was really good at her job. So I surrounded myself with people who saw me the way I was so desperate to see myself. And for a long time, that was enough. And then when I co-founded Whole30 and decided to step off on my own, I really had to do the incredibly hard work of recognizing that I could no longer feed off of everybody else's validation. Because if I allowed their external validation to prop me up, I also had to allow their criticism to cut me down. It's like two sides of the same coin. Wow. You can't have one without the other. And that's when I went back to therapy and started doing the very hard work to build my self-confidence and self-esteem from the inside. So I was no longer reliant on what other people said or thought of me. And that... Took a couple years. Huh. I always reflect back. I talk to myself a lot. I, I listen to stuff and I'm always thinking back and I always wish that that I hadn't made mistakes. I always wish that I hadn't wasted time or thought, oh man, maybe there's a way I could have shortcutted it or get it or gotten to the destination quicker. And yet the other side of me, the rational side of me goes, I don't know how I would have done it any different. <laughs> right? Like maybe it's nice to think like, oh, it would have been great. And I hear you say, like, you realize that when you launched your business, the things that were motivating you, and I used to be, and I probably still am, but I used to be super motivated by uh, recognition. And so the things that used to motivate you were no longer going to serve you, and you had to go back and do that work. We keep circling around the same thing, which is like, this takes time. And you got to work through the process before it'll start to come naturally to you, before it'll start to become easier, before it's something that you just start to do. But yeah. like piece by piece, it just takes a long time to get there. And so what advice do you have for those of us who either <laughs> don't want to take the time, want everything to happen now or faster, or even question whether it's worth it? Oh, I mean, when I think about all of the time and energy, like physical energy I spent trying to avoid doing this work, trying to avoid unpacking my trauma and figuring out why I was using in the first place and trying to avoid looking at the relationships that I had damaged in my addiction and how I was going to make amends and looking at all of the stories I had about myself, about why I was still 10 years into recovery and I still thought of myself as someone who was a complete imposter in her role. All of the avoiding was so much harder than just taking the box, putting it down, opening the lid and being like, all right, let's take a look. It's certainly painful. It's certainly uncomfortable. I had to get 
incredibly comfortable sitting with discomfort, like sitting in uncomfortable feelings and not numbing, distracting, running away, moving away from them in whatever capacity I used to do, because all of those other capacities were really unhealthy. I had to just sit with it and be like, what am I feeling? Where do I feel it in my body? What's coming up for me? Can I remember feeling like this in childhood? And again, I had therapy guiding me through a lot of this. But as uncomfortable, as it was nowhere near as hard or energetically expensive as what it took to like hold that stuff off and just like keep it buried and keep it in the dark. I've heard people who lost a lot of weight. I went from pretty heavy to less heavy, but I'm talking people who lost two or 300 pounds often say, yeah, it's a lot of work to change and to become that person. But what I never anticipated was how much effort and work it took just to be like a really obese person or things I lost, the things I missed out on, the little hits to my ego or my self-esteem, the things that I just had to avoid, the things I couldn't do, the amount of effort it took to be able to get up and like, go up the stairs or things like that. And sh sure, it's work to lose weight or to eat healthier to change my life, but I didn't realize how much energy and work I would free up by not having to do all that other stuff. Yes. The phrase I've been using for the better part of a decade is you choose your hard. Because when I was out there new to Whole30 doing a nutrition workshop and people were saying how amazing it was and how great it was and I was so smart and I spoke so well and I would get so filled up by that. Thank you. That's so wonderful. And then I would go on social media and people were like, you don't have a nutrition degree. You're not like a doctor. The stuff you're saying doesn't make sense. Why do you have so much makeup on? Why do you whatever? And it would cut me down so quickly. That was so hard. I was living and dying every single day based on what people were saying or thinking about me. Going back to therapy and doing the intense exercises that I did with my therapist to be like, why do you have value inherently as a person? Is it because you have this business? Is it because you have this brand? Is it because you have this social media platform? That has nothing to do with who you are as a person. So what are the characters that nobody can take away from you? The characteristics that make you who you are. And then I want you to get real granular on how you feel about you in all of these different... How pretty are you? How pretty are you? Do you think? Are you beautiful? Are you ugly? Are you... Let's get super granular on that so that when somebody says to you, you look like a horse, you're like, that's interesting. I know how I feel about myself. How well do you write? So that when you get an Amazon review that says you write like a fifth grader, you could go, huh, that's interesting. That person is choosing to experience me like that, but I know how I write. That was equally hard. But once I had that... Then I was like unshakable. And this on the other side where I was living and dying based on other people's opinions, that was going to put me on like just this tumultuous sea for the rest of my life. So they were both hard. I just chose my heart. Mm -hmm. 